Uh, Frank, you just wrote a, uh, an article. I want to get right into it here because of our time to make sure we uh, use it properly. But you uh, entitled a, uh, an article you just wrote, Now Bob Gates Tells Us, in which you mentioned that uh, while it's good that Bob Gates is speaking up, former Secretary of Defense, for those who are listening, it would be far better to have had him parted comp. Uh, it would have been far better for him to have parted company with the Obama administration and spoken up earlier. Uh, can I ask you, what in particular did you find to be the most revealing by uh, former Secretary of Defense Bob Gates' recent revelations? Well, let me hasten that. I, I've not read the book yet. Um, it's just come out today, and uh, I'm going on the basis, really, of what others have had an opportunity okay. to, uh, to read and, and distill from it. I think the most important takeaway I've had from it is uh, the former Secretary of Defense made it pretty plain that inside the senior councils of the White House uh, in the Obama administration, there was uh, not only a, a micromanaging of the defense portfolio and, and national security foreign policy agenda more broadly, but it was largely driven by uh, both people who put politics ahead of everything else, uh, people who didn't trust the military, um, people who did not have any particular background or knowledge or expertise in matters of national security, uh, and who were apparently fairly sanguine, if not actually exuberant, in engaging in what I think of, these are my words, not his, but a wrecking operation against uh, the armed forces of the United States and, and the capabilities that we need them uh, to bring to bear on our behalf. You put all that together, it's a pretty serious indictment. But, you know, it's ironic that this is a book entitled Duty. And my view of it is that Bob Gates had a duty to tell us about these problems before now. And I know that there are some like John McCain, who I consider to be about as wrong as, well, as Bob Gates thinks Joe Biden is on things, uh, which is to say about all the time. Uh, John McCain has said, well, he should have waited another couple of years. Rubbish. He should have told us this kind of information uh, if he found it as objectionable as he wants us to believe he, he did uh, when it was happening, and certainly before the last election. So the American people might have had an opportunity to make an informed choice as to whether to re-up this guy as our commander-in-chief. I would agree. I would agree with you, uh, Frank Gaffney, from uh, pre President of the Security Policy in uh, Washington. But, you know, have we also seen a, almost a purging of the military? So many of our generals that were in place are gone. Some of them, the strangest things that seem to have come up that have forced them out. Uh, uh, I mean, it almost seems that if somebody opens their mouth, they're gone. Is, is, is that perhaps partly why Robert Gates or others perhaps have not opened their mouth earlier? Oh, I don't know. Uh, I, I, you'd have to ask Robert Gates why he didn't. Um, yeah. uh, usually, in my experience, uh, it's only partly uh, the sense that uh, they might lose their job. It's, it's usually rationalized by the idea that other people wouldn't do as good a job protecting whatever it is they think they're protecting as, as they do, uh, or, or that, uh, you know, it's it's their duty, uh, you know, to, to hang in there or what have you. But um, in this case, I, I really believe, uh, and I had some experience with this myself, uh, that resigning in principle, when you hold a position of trust in the government, when you find what you're being told you need to do or asked to do, is fundamentally contrary to the oath of office you took right. uh, to, to uphold and to protect the Constitu Constitution of the United States, for example, um, you have a responsibility to make known that that is objectionable to you and to, uh, and to let others understand what's going on by, you know, resigning in, in protest. Well... We're going to go. Let's let's go to the next step here. I, I agree with that. Uh, Barack Obama's claim. He he made a claim that we are in a safer world. That uh, Al Qaeda is on the path to defeat. I think were the actual words, and that he and that he ended the war in Iraq. Uh, it seems to me to be a rather bald-faced distortion. But 
in that light, the recent fall of uh, Fallujah and Ramadi in Iraq, uh, to me, confirms a rather disastrous reality, and that seems Iraq is in the critical position of whether or not it will survive. In your opinion, with al-Qaeda now taking those two cities, are they... Are we in danger of seeing an Al Qaeda beachhead being established in the Middle East? Well, I'm afraid that the <laughs> the beachhead is a, is an entire shore at the moment uh, in the Middle East. There are uh, any number of parts uh, of of that region, as well as North Africa, and in fact, you now Sub-Saharan Africa, that are under the control, functional control of those who uh, adhere to the same agenda as Al Qaeda. And, you know, we can get into a pedantic argument over whether they are formally part of al-Qaeda, part of al-Qaeda core, part of one of its franchises, whether they are affiliates, whether they are in some other way associated with al-Qaeda, or whether they're just plain old-fashioned jihadists, people who believe that it is God's will that they impose Sharia on everybody else through whatever means are available. And that could be the Muslim Brotherhood. That could be uh, various other organizations, some of which, uh, as I say, make plain their uh, ties to al-Qaeda, and some of which don't. But the problem is, if we keep deluding ourselves into thinking that al-Qaeda is the only problem, um, we're going to let the Muslim Brotherhood, among others, uh, engage in jihad very successfully against us, I'm afraid. Well, well, that's so, an interesting my view of this is that that's, that's not the problem here. The problem is that... Um, that we're we're dealing with a community of people that is not confined to the Middle East anymore, certainly not just to uh, you know Iraq, which we have ceded to uh, to uh, them in part, Ramadi, Fallujah, uh, uh, the Anbar province, and so on, but you know whole swaths of the uh, the earth are now under the control of people who espouse what Al Qaeda espouses and seek through whatever means to uh, to wage jihad against us. Uh, Frank Gaffney, we've had uh, I've had guests on here who have uh, been rather insistent in uh, in, in parsing uh, the differences between Hezbollah, Hamas, uh, Brotherhood, uh, Al Qaeda, and in saying that they that they really are distinct, they're different. Look, let's face it, they're fighting each other on the ground. You seem to be making more of a statement that mm, those are differences without any real substance. Is that what you're saying? I'm saying that the people who believe it is preordained by Allah that they will rule the world uh, and will do so as a result of violent jihad where they can engage in it and civilization jihad, as the Muslim Brotherhood calls it, where that's not possible, are our enemies. And Al-Qaeda just happens to be one of the organizations or, or names under which they're doing business. But it is delusional and fatuous and recklessly irresponsible to believe that that's the full extent of the problem, especially just core al-Qaeda, which, as you correctly pointed out, the president lied repeatedly about in, in his... Uh, pre-election pattern that uh, they were on the path to defeat. It, it's not true even of core al-Qaeda, let alone all of the people that I'm talking about who really are the problem. You know, at this point, uh, there may be no choice for us but to uh, bail out of Afghanistan. Uh, we've, we've set that trajectory under this president. Uh, Hamid Karzai is uh, diddling us over whether to sign an agreement that would allow some number of Americans to remain, but the rules of engagement under which they would be obliged to operate are such as to put their lives in jeopardy, it seems to me. I don't know that they'll do much good for Afghanistan, and they may not be able to do much good for themselves. The question really is, in their absence, is it likely we'll see something comparable to what we're now witnessing in Iraq? And I think the chances of that are 100%. So, so, obviously, so if we step out, a void is created. Al-Qaeda, who have been found, who, whoever, whoever happens to be the face of uh, evil on that side is going to fill that gap. Now, it bothers me a little bit, but they're sitting there right beside pa Pakistan. 
uh, Pakistan has nuclear weapons. Let me let me throw this connection in there. Saudi Arabia seems to have made an arrangement with Pakistan, and either they have already obtained some nuclear weapons, or at least an agreement to do so, from what I'm understanding. Um, does that connection? Um, uh, does is that is that whole threat perspective of a Pakistani and a nu- nuclear armed Saudi Arabia enhanced? Or how does this whole thing tie into that? I think we've already created a vacuum. I think the president, having made clear that uh, we're going to begin withdrawing American forces as he was announcing the surge, and that they would all be gone by the end of the year, combat forces at least by the end of the year, this year, uh, has established in the minds of our enemies that uh, the vacuum is there and they are filling it. Uh, in this case, uh, it is the Taliban that is the principal face of that. Uh, they are associated with al-Qaeda, as they have been since before 9-11. And my guess is that they and al-Qaeda will operate over large areas of Afghanistan, if, if not once again run the country. And that will have implications. Uh, the Taliban, of course, are a creature of the Pakistani uh, intelligence service, the ISI. And they will be, I suspect, um, more or less the dominant force in uh, in Afghanistan, as they were in the previous period uh, before 9-11. Uh, and the Pakistanis are not our friends. As you say, they've, uh, they've apparently made a deal with the Saudis to supply them with nuclear weapons. Uh, I would be very surprised if they haven't made that deal with others. Um, they are uh, basically... A, a something between a failed state and an Islamist supremacist state. And the idea that either one is going to have a, a nuclear arsenal of several hundred weapons in all likelihood before too long is uh, is a very frightening prospect. So that's what my my take on the whole thing was as well. I don't see any good thing coming out of that, and uh, and I have no confidence that uh, the administration is not just plunging us further into a black hole there. It's going to be filled. Now we we have a few minutes left here at the end. I, I want to come back if I can to the uh, to the kind of like the first question uh, that I raised. Uh, the, Barack Obama said at one point. Al Qaeda is on the path to defeat. We are a safer world. Uh, you came back and said, "Well, Al Qaeda is a lot of places, and you named a few." Uh, sum up and kind of re- recast, if you could, uh, Al Qaeda in terms of uh, their strength, their presence, uh, and uh, and uh, their potential impact on us in terms of are we safer today than we were. Al-Qaeda's principal strength is that it ties into, taps into, uh, this notion that uh, it is God's will that they will succeed in imposing his law, his ideology, doctrine, whatever you want to call it, this this thing they they describe as Sharia, all over the world. It means that they have access to money. It means they have access to manpower. It means they have access to, uh, well, nations, in some cases, um, and others who wish to support them in advancing this common goal. Um, They will do so, to some extent, in league with others who have different organizational affiliations that share those same goals, like the Muslim Brotherhood. The Muslim Brotherhood was the godfather of Mm al-Qaeda, in fact. Um, So what you're looking at, I'm afraid, is a circumstance in which if you do not destroy these guys, and I don't mean all Muslims, I mean the ones who are intent on following the dictates of Sharia, which requires them them to engage in jihad against us, the infidels, the non-believers. If you don't destroy them or otherwise incapacitate them, discourage them to the point where they do not pursue what they believe is God's will, um, they will ultimately bring about your destruction. And I think any notions as to what we're up against, who we're up against, what is involved, what is required, that deviate from those just fundamental realities is, as I said earlier, delusional 
and dangerous in the extreme. We're going to have to close this now because of the time, but I think that's just where we're going to leave it. Basically, we are not safer, and this administration has not put al-Qaeda on the road to defeat, actually just the opposite. So we need to come back and talk about this a little bit further today. Before we go, I want you to give our listeners where to go to find out more about you and and follow your, your writings at all. Uh, The Center for Security Policy's website is securefreedom.org, and I would commend to you all an online video course called muslimbrotherhoodinamerica.com, which uh, goes into all of this in considerable detail. And I can attest to the value of that, a Muslim Brotherhood in America, absolutely a great resource. Frank Gaffney, founder and president of the Center for Security Policy in Washington, thanks for being with us today on the Conservative Commander Radio Show. We look forward to having you back with us.